All right, ladies and gentlemen, happy Friday. The day is April 17th, I believe. Um, and we've made it through uh, a couple sonnets this week, and I hope you've enjoyed them so far. Today, we're taking a look at Sonnet 75, which is um, also done by Edmund Spencer. I think we have one more by him after this before we shift gears. Um, I have a picture of the ocean, which you're going to see in a minute, that is pretty relevant to uh, the content for this particular poem. Remember, Sonnet's these 14-line poems written in iambic pentameter with a relatively set rhyme scheme. Um, they're pretty impressive to make them fit this form. And I think maybe we take for granted because it looks easy, but um, I'm always impressed by it. Okay, so an introduction to this sonnet. This sonnet's going to depict the speaker's attempts to make his loved one immortal. Okay, so he keeps writing his lover's name in the sands. Um, at the beach and he gets frustrated when they get washed away. You know, the tide keeps coming up just like with a sand castle that you build earlier in the morning. And then by the afternoon it's gone because that's what happens at the beach. The woman reacts to the writing of her name on the beach and just tells him that these attempts are useless because she just like her name that he's writing in the sand, it's going to disappear from the world one day and be forgotten. Um, you're, you know, she's going to call him out for trying to make something that is mortal you know, will die her into something immortal. He disagrees, the speaker, arguing that through the lines of his poem, both she and their love for one another will live forever. Again, these sonnet writers have a pretty lofty opinion of their poetry, their art form. And, um, you know, we saw that in Sonnet 1 as well, um, which was the first one in this sonnet sequence I'm already. All right, let's take a look at it. One day I wrote her name upon the strand, and the strand is like that strip of sand by the beach but came the waves and washed it away. Again, I write it with a second hand, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. Vain man, said she, that doest in vain assay a mortal thing so to immortalize, for I myself shall like to this decay. And eke, or means also, my name be wiped out likewise. Not so, quote, or said I, let baser things devise to die in dust, but you shall live by fame. My verse, your virtues rare, shall eternize, and in the heavens write your glorious name. Where when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live and later life renew. So first things first, rhyme scheme. You can see I'm establishing it here with all these rhymes that very, uh, they fit together pretty, pretty clearly. Cleanly. There's no stretches with words with this particular sonnet. All right, it's Spencer wrote it, hence is a Spencerian sonnet. He follows the Spencerian rhyme scheme of three quatrains and a couplet with interlocking quatrains that share one rhyme sound. Hopefully we're pretty familiar with that by now. Question one on your packet just asks you to identify that rhyme scheme and the type of sonnet. So it's a Spencerian sonnet, and you can see the rhyme scheme there. Uh, question two, what is the speaker unsuccessfully trying to do in the first quatrain of the sonnet? Hopefully, that's pretty clear to you. He's trying to write her name on the strip of beach, the strand, and the waves keep coming and washing it away. And he does it a second time and it does the same thing. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but on the Ocean City Boardwalk, there used to be a movie theater called The Strand. And that was, once I learned what that word meant, it made sense. Oh, it's on the beach, that strip of sand by the water. Question three, personification. Explain how the tide is personified. Okay, so personification giving human-like traits to, you know, something that is not human or, you know, does not have those abilities. If you take a look at the highlighted part of line four, the tide made my pains, his efforts to write the name, his prey. So that makes the tide like a predator and his efforts to write the, in the sand like the victim of the tide, that the tide is seeking to destroy him. Okay, so there's their personification. Question four, why does the lady say the speaker's attempts are futile or useless? Um, let's take a look at quatrain two for this. Even though I've only highlighted lines um, six, seven, and eight, I'm going to start with line uh, five. Vain man, said she, that doest in vain essay a mortal thing so to immortalize. And here's your answer. For I myself shall like to this decay, and eke or also my name be wiped out li likewise. She goes, it's useless to try to make something mortal immortal. Just like me, I'm going to be washed away and no one's going to remember me on this earth. And before you think it's like really stupid to write the name on the beach, um, yes, he could have probably picked something more permanent. But this is like no different than when people like etch initials on a tree, you know, JG loves ST. You know, my husband and I did that on a tree when we were at a resort on our honeymoon or, um, 
you know, when people write in spray paint in the city, you know, their initials or that they love somebody or if they get a tattoo with their name with a heart around it. Like these are always we kind of attempt to make something permanent out of the feelings that we're feeling. So for whatever it's worth, that might might offer a better understanding. Question five. In lines five and six, how does how the lady describes him and his actions, or how does the lady describe him and his actions, and how is it used differently in both cases? So the word vain is used twice in lines, uh, actually just line five, um, but she continues to explain in line six. Let's take a look at a couple ways that the word vain can be used. All right. As an adjective, its first meaning is having or showing an excessively high opinion of one's appearance, abilities, or worth. So if you think back to our last sonnet, Narcissus was vain. He was, you know, excessively uh, preoccupied with how he looked and had a very high opinion of it. That's why he couldn't look away from the stream, um, if you recall that allusion to Greek mythology. Um, a second meaning is for if something is vain, it's, it's producing no result or it's useless. So considering that, let's look again at, at question five. Um, he's vain in the sense, she calls him a vain man because he actually thinks it's efforts. He has the ability to make her permanent in the earth and, and so that people will remember her forever. And so she kind of makes, teases him a little bit about that and calls him vain, which is not complimentary. Um, and then let's look at the second part. He did that, that doest in vain a say or try to make a mortal thing immortal. It's, it's a vain attempt to try to do that because it's useless. It's, it's not going to last. Okay. So it's a little bit different in both cases there. Question six, the speaker degrees with what disagrees with what she says and what reason or explanation does he offer? So here's where the, the sonnet takes a different turn. He goes, not so. He's basically like, nah, -uh. let baser or lower things than you devise to die in dust. He goes, but you shall live by fame. And here's why my verse, the lines of the poem that I'm writing, like verses in a song, my verse, your virtues rare shall eternize. Okay. So the syntax is a little off. The order of the words is a little off there, but let me rephrase that. He says, my verse shall eternize or make eternal your rare virtues. Okay. And in the heavens, my poems will write your glorious name. Obviously there's some hyperbole and a uh, little imagery effect there going on. But again, I told you, sonnet writers have a pretty high opinion of their art and their form. Um, so he's saying, you know, I disagree with you. You're not going to be forgotten because you are this superior being. You're not like the baser or lower things in this world that are just going to die because my poetry is going to basically preserve you forever. Question seven, what connection does the poem make between immortality and poetry? Okay, I'm kind of reiterating a similar point here with this question. Um, but you can see that the speaker believes that the poem, poetry makes someone immortal, that poetry can make you live forever. And before that sounds super ridiculous, I mean, perhaps you can argue maybe there's some truth to it because this was like written in the, what, the late 1500s. I think those are the dates for Edmund Spencer. And here we are, it's 2020, we're remote learning and, you know, with some kind of pandemic going on. And here we are reading and talking about this love story. So perhaps there's some truth to that. Question eight, where is the turning point or the volta in this sonnet? And explain how the sonnet changes its course here. So we talked about the volta with the last poem and I'm there again, they're in all the sonnets. Um, but let's take a look again what a volta is. Um, it's the turn in the sonnet or a moment of dramatic shift or in the tone or theme an abrupt or sudden change in thoughts or arguments. There's often some kind of initial word that offers a change of direction. You know, the words, but yet, and yet. We don't have that in this poem, but we do have a pretty clear one where he just says, not so. He basically says, uh-uh, that's not the case. Let me explain to you why. And you see a break in, in what this, uh, the direction of the sonnet. Um, so the first part is his attempts to watch her, write her name in the sand and the tide washing it away and her calling him out saying, that's silly, you can't make me immortal. You can't put my name and it's not gonna last. And he goes, nope, that's not true. Actually, let me tell you why, because my verses are going to preserve you for all eternity. Okay, so you should be able to explain that okay there. All right, and question nine. Question nine, I just ask you to summarize what this sonnet is about in two to three sentences. So hopefully you can kind of summarize that for me to kind of show your final understanding of this piece. Okay, and that's Spencer's Sonnet 79. Let me close this out. All right, I'll talk to you guys later.